Welcome, everybody, to the Chelsea Music Hall. I am your host, Puffin Ball, and this is the Bellwether Culture Podcast. We record live in front of live, hand-selected, invite-only studio audiences, and uh, they are here with us for this recording with Mr. Jeff Staple. Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, so in my introduction of you, I mean, uh, we talked through anything from like retail and, um, and being, of course, you're most notable for uh, catalyzing a, a culture that used to be subculture, uh, which is now translated into pop culture and what we know mm-hmm. broadly as uh, sneaker culture, or sneaker heads. Yeah. Um, in your head, uh, who are you and what are you all about? Uh, damn, that's a tough question. Esoteric question yeah. to start it off. I don't know, like... I have two ways of answering this question, I think. One way is, like, I like to say I'm a creator because I'm able to... I'm blessed with the ability to be able to, like, execute ideas on many different mediums and formats, whether it is a store or a sneaker or a clothing line or a logo or a brand identity or a marketing campaign, whatever it is. Like, um, it's kind of like a... It's like a painter who has, like, a million different types of paintbrushes or color pencils at their disposal, you know? So it's like... I can take an idea and like, you know, we did a collaboration with Shake Shack. So I could take an idea and like execute it onto like a milkshake and a burger, you know. Yo, what brand have you not done a collaboration with? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, so creator is one. But um, the other thing that I like to say, uh, particularly when I'm like on an airplane and like a stranger asks me, Mm -hmm. is I like to say I'm a teacher because that sounds really boring and the conversation ends right after that. But it's true. I mean, I, I do think that at this point um, in, in my career of being in this for two decades plus, you know, I've had Staple now. Staple Design as a company is 23, wait, 22 years old. Mm-hmm. Uh, the company's 22 years old. I've probably been working as a professional for 25, 26 years. So it's like a quarter century now. And What I try to do now is as much as I want to produce and output work, it's also important for me to like teach and mentor as well. And so when I say teacher, I mean, I'm not lying because I am teaching and and I also do like literally teach, like I teach at universities, I Mm -hmm. teach on Skillshare. So I like to say teacher and then the the other guy on the plane's usually like, okay, cool. (laughs) Cool, cool, cool. What what movies are on. (laughs) Exactly, yeah. So yeah, teacher, creator, either one, depending on who you're talking to. We'll start with your journey because it is absolutely fascinating. It is, um, like many of us, a bunch of zigs and zags versus a straight line. Um, You know, uh, through school, um, you studied journalism. uh, Uh You kind of took what you took from that. Uh, You went on to Parsons, kind of dabbled in the more creative arts, uh, took what you took from that. Uh, You... You know, you went into uh, opening up a a store, Mm -hmm. um, took what you took from that. I mean... I want to, I guess, what I've realized about you is that you take unconventional paths, right, forward. So whether that's your upbringing of kind of being well-documented and being like, yo, I'm a middle-of-the-lane kind of kid. You know what yeah. I mean? You weren't excelling. You weren't kind of, you know, flunking out. But you're, yeah. you're middle of the road. And very middle. Very, very average. <laughs> yeah. Very, very average. And, but you've had this acumen to be able to leap and make these moves that are well beyond the times. Mm. And an example of this would be is so going to NYU at journalism, you know, you figured out the the art of storytelling. And you use that acumen to ultimately convince folks, well, or to use it at, at Fader for the first maybe what, fifteen, twenty Yeah. Episode. Yeah, uh, yeah. It was fifteen or how many how many were there? Uh, 20 issues, yeah, the first like, yeah, issues yep. of Fader. And um, in that parlay that into a relationship or a story they used as a journalism to, to go out to Japan and convince them that, hey, we really got to, um, uh, uh, we really have to go out there and get the story on Hiroki F- uh, Fujiwara, mm-hmm. who's, you know, who's trending out there. There's this huge hype around, you know, this designer with a musician and the streetwear and the, what they're doing is fantastic. Yeah. Like, you make it sound very like calculated, but it wasn't no. that. I didn't know what I was doing actually. <laughs> like when yeah. I took journalism, uh, you know, really what I wanted to do was uh, I wanted to be a creative writer. Like I wanted to do like my dream would have been to be like Stephen King and like write novels and stuff. But the mm. the number of sort of best selling novelists that are out there are like it's like hitting a lottery ticket. You know what I mean? It's like one in a 
a bajillion. So yep. the the sort of more sensible, um, uh, financially, f you know, like reasonable thing to do was journalism because then you could just get a job at a newspaper or magazine and be a writer. And so I went with journalism instead of creative creative writing, um, and. It was dope because little did I know that what journalism was teaching me was how to, as you said, tell a story, you know. Um, and then I did get into the Fader magazine, and I, I was at the Fader as the art director of the magazine for, mm -hmm. like, from the second issue to, like, the like the 20th issue or so. Um, and, yeah, being that I had the journalism background, the publishers, um, shout out Rob Stone and John Cohen, they said, hey, if you want to contribute some articles, you know, since you have this journalism degree, like, go ahead and contribute some. Um, but it wasn't, like, calculated, like, on some chess move type shit where yeah. it's like, you know, I got journalism, I'm going to parlay this into that. Like, it was just, I think, um, I think the, the issue that's happening in today's society, actually, is that there's too much maneuvering and there is too much like plotting that's going on and not enough like listening to yourself of what it is that you actually want to do. You know, so like I went from journalism to design not because I thought it would get me a Nike shoe, mm -hmm. but it's just because I liked each of those things. Would you have ever thought that you were going to get a Nike shoe? Never. <laughs> yeah. In a million years. I mean, you got to understand like when well, also, I... Well, also Nike didn't do things like that back then. Right, exactly. <laughs> it's not like there was yeah. 25 collabs a year and like you could get one of them. There was just, yeah. it wasn't didn't existent. Happen. Yeah. Right. Um, and then, so yeah, so parlaying that into a, a story that I wanted to pitch, you know, just to sort of recount that story, what was happening back, this is like in 1998, 1999, uh, shout out to anyone that was born then and like remember what was going on, but um, this was an era where Nike was making shoes in regions, right? So right now, when, you know, Adi drops a Yeezy or Nike drops an Off-White, it's like a global release. You can find that shoe in the top retailers in every country in the, in the world. Back then, it was like they had this thing called co.jp. They had Nike EU. Yeah, so like they would drop things only in Europe, only in Japan. And the only way you could get it is if you flew to Japan, bought it, and brought it back, you know? And there were some cats doing that. Actually, like, the founder of Flight Club, his name mm -hmm. is Demaney, he was one of those original OG guys that would fly to Japan with an empty suitcase, buy up, like, Japan-only air forces, and then bring them back and set up a little store. That little store ended up becoming Flight Club, you know? Um, and I, I, as a fan of that, wanted to know, I wanted to sit down with Nike Japan and be like, why the fuck are you doing this? Like, mm -hmm. if you know this shit is hot, if you know people are flying in from other countries to get this, why don't you just call up your friends at Nike America and be like, let's drop this in Nike America. Why are you making this so difficult? You know, why are you doing things in limited quantities? And you got to understand, like, I'm pitching this to Rob Stone, and he's like, wait, Nike's... Limited a, quality? Yeah, limited? Quality? What do you yeah. mean? They're making billions of dollars. They're making yeah. limited edition shoes. What's the point? Yeah, and this is like, saying this now is like so naive. Like, mm -hmm. of course, there's a reason for this. But like, I wanted to get to the story, so he convinced, you know, the whole company to be like, let's bring Jeff out to Japan, pay for his ticket. And uh, what's funny is I remember he was like, so you know how to get in touch with like all the right people in Japan to do this interview, right? I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah I got yeah, this. I got this, definitely. I was like, I don't know anything. I don't know anybody in Japan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like I didn't know Hiroshi, you know, like Nike introduced me to Hiroshi. Yeah. So I, I literally landed in Japan and I walked into a sneaker store and I was like, where do you get your Nikes from? Can you give me the phone number of that person? Um, yeah. Yeah, and then come to find out, Nike headquarters is not even in Tokyo. It's like you have to take an hour-long train to this sure. island, like another island, mm -hmm. right? And then so I went out there, literally just went to the front desk, and I'm like, I had a copy of the fader, and I was like, I'm from this magazine. I want to do an interview. And they're like, with who? I'm like, <laughs> the person who's in charge. <laughs> like, yeah, 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 let's do go. some shit. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I find after being there for like over a week, I finally Shit. netted an interview with the guy who controls the limited edition stuff. <laughs> yeah. So, all right, we're, we're, we're all right. So, uh, of course, we're 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 journeying down the sneaker side, but your retail expertise and what you've done with uh, the Reed space is iconic to to the New York and Thank Lower you. East Side neighborhood. Yeah. Um, stay power, fifteen years. Yes, like fifteen years in one location no, in LA. I mean, you just heard from from Michael. It's like you know, we we hope as venues in general, whether retail or performance art spaces or anything or mm -hmm. restaurants. That, like, you could have that tipping point of 10 years. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, we weren't, like, a laundromat or, like, a dry cleaner yeah. or a bodega. You know, like, we were, like, 
a weird fucking store back then, and no yeah. one really knew what we were doing. Very current now, though. Yeah, I mean, you know, we were just talking backstage. They, like, yeah. they opened up a Starbucks around the corner that's got like a clothing store in it. It's Willy Wonka's like, Starbucks Yeah, it's just like it, this, this idea of like a lifestyle boutique culture mm-hmm. where like you could go in and get, you know, coffee, books, you know, clothing. Mm-hmm. You, you could go to a Victoria's Secret now and there's like the book section there, you know, yeah. like in the music section to wear with your lingerie. <laughs> it's like, it's all about this blending of cultures. And I think Reed Space and shout out Sarah from Colette in Paris, like we were really the only two doing it, you know? And Sarah, every time she came to New York, she'd come to Reed Space and be like, how's business? Like, cause you and I are the only ones who yeah. get what it is that we're doing, you know? Well, I mean, you had, well, we, we like to call it experiential retail, right? Or, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, that's, that's kind that's of the, 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 the term for yes. it. And everyone is, every brand is trying to connect to their consumer through these engaging experiences. Yeah. So uh, Restoration Hardware, they have a beautiful rooftop. You yep. could use their cafe as co-working on the third floor. Like, I mean, yeah. it's just where it is right yep. um coffee shops inside of stores is more and more common you know yeah absolutely um and now like i don't know if you saw we work um yeah the we la- the, um, made by we which is like we work now has a retail store and all of their their wares inside of it are from we workers yes we workers brilliant. design the stuff that are in the store yeah Brilliant. Yeah, I know. Right? So now, what, Reed Space, though, tell me about it, because you were doing art gallery shows in there, you were doing performances, I mean, there's all kinds <laughs> all right. of things, that, like, whatever you wanted I'll, to do, I'll you I'll tell were you the strategic it. genius vision behind Reed Space. Another, so, another strategic Yeah, another, <laughs> another, <laughs> another blueprint, ready? Yeah. So, in 2000, we were actually deep in Chinatown on Division and Canal, mm-hmm. right? And then, of course, everyone knows what happened in 9-11 of 2001, the Twin Towers fell, you know, our office was in the shadows of the Twin Towers. And after that, obviously anything below Canal Street was literally like a no-fly zone. Like you, every time you went down below Canal, Mm -hmm. cops would have to check your ID to make sure there was a reason you were going below Canal. And so our office was down there, power was going out every week. Um, It literally got to the point where like, if, if, uh, if we were printing something and all of our computers are on and then the phone rang, all the power would go out because it would just be draining the yep. power grid too much. So we had to move, and uh, I, knew I, I knew I had to find a new location. I wanted to stay downtown. And at the time, I was DJing a lot. Mm-hmm. Like, I was like a regular DJ at like uh, lounges and clubs, and I was DJing at this old spot called Swim on Orchard Street, Orchard between Rivington and Stanton. I do not remember that. Do you remember Swim? No, I don't. Oh, okay, it's way before. I mean, this okay. is, yeah, like 95 to like 01, 02. Like the, is it like the... The previous Bob? Yeah, it was just like Bob. Yeah. Exactly the same as Bob. Okay. But it's, it's uh, Bob and them existed at the same time. And I spun a couple times at Bob, too. Gotcha. So it's, it's that type of vibe. And I had, the, I had Thursday night, you know, 10 to 4 a.m. every Thursday, and I would DJ. Solid. Yeah, and so Swim was right across uh, from where Reed Space was going to be on Orchard Street. And, you know, when this is pre-Uber, pre-Lyft, and pre Serato. Okay, so imagine me, 4.30 in the morning, I just finished my gig, I have seven crates of vinyl, oh, yeah. right? Because yeah, yeah. I had to do a six hour set, and then I have to, f- I have to wait for a yellow cab, not, but not a yellow cab, the SUV one. Mm-hmm. So I'd just be standing there for like an hour <laughs> waiting for like a minivan <laughs> SUV to come. And so I'd just be standing there, right, at 4.30 <laughs> in the morning in the LES. Yeah. And I looked across the street one day and I saw a for rent sign, and I just, went like that and I was like, holy shit, this space is amazing. And I was looking for a replacement to my office and so I called the number and that was Reed Space. And um, just to give you some perspective, the original office that we were in, our rent was $2,000 a month. Okay, and I called this place up, the Reed Spa- which was gonna be Reed Space, and I said, how much is the rent? And he said it was 8,000. So it was a 4X multiplier of, of my rent. Yeah. And um, I was like, yeah, I didn't have a store at the time. I had staple design offices and staple clothing, sort of like I needed an office for that. But I was like, man, people have been asking me for a store. I want to open a store. I had a lot of friends that were in streetwear and had a, a small clothing line. And I was like, they always wanted a home like for all of us to be together. Mm-hmm. And I have DJs who make mixtapes. I have friends who make zines. I have <laughs> artists who make art. I was like, what if I just made a clubhouse for all of us. Yeah, and split that $8,000. Yeah. Oh, yeah. no, I would pay the $8,000. Okay. <laughs> they would maybe do something in the store that I could make money on to then pay the rent. But it wasn't like um, yeah. it wasn't like a co-sharing space where, like, artist, you pay 
1000 DJ. It was merchandised you, together. Yes, it was merchandised mm -hmm. together by me, you know. Mm -hmm. And so that was the birth of Readspace. And so I wasn't trying to make a experiential lifestyle boutique. I wasn't trying to like push the culture forward. I was like A, trying to find a home for my ass and B, trying to help my friends find a home for their shit. And that's what Reed there Space really like, like. That should really be the bio like, line for Reed Space. Like, <laughs> trying to find a home for my friends. For my friends and their shit. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Uh, uh, so I want to do, to, uh, let's touch on the origin story of stable design itself, because uh, I think that's fascinating. Um, it was happenstance again, right? Yeah. Like you, you basically saw that expression on t-shirts or the, the equivalent of like graffiti art, but legal at the time. Yeah. Or graffiti art was super illegal at the time. So yeah. that was your way of getting a message. It's like, oh, let me design a t-shirt. My friends could rock it, get a message out there. Exactly, yeah. And roaming into Triple Five Soul, mm -hmm. um, they're like, yo, dope shirt, let me grab 12. Yep, that's like, how Yeah, hey, no problem. Yeah, and I was, I was uh, at the time, silk screening these shirts at uh, Parsons School of Design. Which, which you weren't allowed to use their silk screen Correct, spot. yeah. So, you know, I had, to, I had to break in every day to the silk screen lab to make these shirts. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's how it began. That's how Staple, the clothing line, began. With a 12-shirt order on Triple Five Souls Lafayette store. That's also kind of how your name began. Yes, Jeff Staple. Yeah. <laughs> Jeff Staple's not my government <laughs> name. But the manager, the manager of the Triple Five Souls store... You know, walk. You know, I walk in and he'd be like, "Yo, it's Jeff Staple." I'm like, Cause "That's not that's yeah. not my name." And he's like, "Yeah, but that's your brand." And so, you know, and my government last name is really hard to pronounce. It's got no vowels in it. It's what is just, your government last name? It's a, it's pronounced Ng. It's spelled N G, yeah, just two sure. letters. Um, but nobody can pronounce that. So the guy was just like, "Yo, Jeff Staple," and I was like, uh, "Don't call me that," you know. Mm -hmm. And he just kept calling me that, and everyone else in the store would call me that, and then it just stuck. And now, like. I have people booking flights and hotels for me under the name Jeff Staple, and I can't get on the plane because oh, it's just shut not the my fuck game. Up. Yeah, it's like Yo, that's. I can't hilarious. get into buildings. It's so funny. Like, wow. All right, <laughs> listen. This is the perfect time to take a quick break. When we come back, more with Jeff Staple of Staple Designs here at Chelsea Music Hall. Thank you. Welcome back, everybody, to Chelsea Music Hall. We are here, of course, in front of a beautiful audience of bellwethers here at Chelsea Music Hall. Give it up. <laughs> so we left off with the origin story of um, Staple Design. Uh, we talked a little bit, or Staple, and then we talked a little bit about Reed Space. And, but how, how now did this, I mean, iconic launch of a collaboration where you had the pigeon for New York City, representing New York City on an SB dunk. And just that whole frenzy. This is the first time uh, that I could rec recollect that there was a frenzy on the street mm -hmm. for a, a pair of sneakers, kids camping out in blizzard-like conditions. Yeah. How, what's, what's the question? Like, how did, how, what is the origin of this? How did, well, how did Nike now come to this point where they said, you know what, <clears throat> why, don't, why don't you do something like this in, in the U.S.? Okay. Um, so let's go back to the Japan story. Let's go back to the Japan right. story. So Japan, I, I interview this guy who leads up all of Nike COJP, mm -hmm. and he's the one who decides all the shit, you know, like, uh, of what's going to come out, how many quantities, and which store gets it, right? And he's also the guy that introduced me to Hiroshi Fujiwara, because he said, Hiroshi is sort of like our bellwether, and he's the one who helps us determine which styles to bring back, which colorways to do how many is the right number and which store to put it out at. So Hiroshi was a key figure in that. So I got to meet Hiroshi then, and we've been great friends ever since. Um, and then, so the guy that I interviewed, his name is Marcus Tayui. He was like, so hold on here, let me just get this straight. He's like, you are the art director of The Fader, but you're here interviewing me, so you're a writer too. You also have this clothing line uh, called Staple. You also um, are a sneakerhead and a big one in, in that sense. Like, you really know your shit. And you're like a graphic designer. Mm -hmm. Like, we should be working together. Oh, shit. And I was like, yeah. No, actually, I was like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Maybe. I was like, maybe. Maybe we should. <laughs> and he's like, no, I got to, he's like, we got to get you out to Beaverton, which is the, the U.S. headquarters mm -hmm. and the global headquarters for Nike. I was like, yeah, let me think about that. Beaverton. Yeah, maybe I'll go. Um, me Inside, I'm just like, fuck yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, best story dream, of my life. Yeah, dream come true <laughs> shit. Like, beyond. Like, my mind is just blown. Yeah. And, uh, and so, shortly after that, a trip out to Beaverton, met up with some key people, and we started designing a lot of stuff. This is pre-Pigeon, okay? Yeah. So we started designing a lot of internal stuff that Nike needs, like graphics, reporting, um, mm -hmm. activation spaces, packaging design. We started just designing all mm -hmm. the stuff. 
me and my small team. And then we actually did some shoes too. So there was like the navigation pack, there was uh, the Nordic pack, there was the laser Cortez, the laser mm -hmm. rift. Like these are all shoes that we designed. But again, this is pre collaboration. Like so it was us designing. It was just it. Nike. Yeah, it was just us. Yeah. It was work for hire. That's Correct. what it was. You know, we got a mm -hmm. check, but it wasn't like brand X Nike, you know? Yeah. And it wasn't until, you know, if, if you go back in sort of sneakerhead history, it was really Nike SB that started the whole conversation of like collaborations, release packs, quick strikes, and all of this stuff, you know? And so Nike SB came, re relaunched. Um, actually, little known fact, like I actually designed the first Nike SB website and catalog. And like, so that's not a collaboration either, yeah. but like we helped relaunch Nike SB in that way. And so I was very close with the Nike SB heads. And so they said, um, yeah, we want to do, you know, I remember he called me up and he was like, I want to do a dunk and I, I want it to be dedicated to New York City. And would you be down to work on that? You know, and they're like, they, he asked me if I would be down to work on that. So I was like, again, I tried I mean, to play honestly, it cool. Honestly though, in his, in his <laughs> seat though, who else better? You know what I mean? Like, you are <laughs> in the culture. You grew up in Jersey. Know. Like, you grew up in the tri-state area. Yeah. You know? You I guess. I don't. I see it as a real blessing. I mean, to be yeah. honest, like, I think a lot of people, not a lot. I think there are some people that probably he could have called as well. But I think one thing that I do really well is not only do I have sort of like the cultural nuances and, and background education, but mm -hmm. more importantly than that, I can fucking hit a deadline. And I can stay on budget, and I can respond to an email, and I can make a meeting not hungover. And like a lot of cats in that era who were more OG and maybe more NYC and maybe more creative couldn't do those very simple things. Like show up and not smell like alcohol. Can you do that? Like, nah, bro, I can't. That's how I get my energy out. Like, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. you know, like that's how it comes out, you know? Like, I just show up and I'm professional. And yeah. when you're talking about multi-billion dollar corporation, that shit matters, you know? So like I show up and I think that's probably more of the reason why than like how OG I am, you know what I mean? I mean, it helps to know that stuff, but like it, it's more important to just be reliable. Yeah, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, the word integrity gets thrown around a lot now, which I appreciate. It's yeah. just being a person of integrity and just having your word and, and getting to it. You know, yeah, and, and also through. the other thing is, you know, execution, right? Like everyone, everyone can come up with an incredible idea, but how many people come up with that great idea and then actually see it to fruition and actually make it like a reality? That's the one in 100 number that like a big brand like Nike really looks at like who, you talk, about, you talk to 100 people in the room, all of them are going to give, oh, I got this great idea, I got this great yeah. idea, but how many of those people in that room can execute on it? And it's probably like one to two of yeah, those people. Not easy. Yeah, it's not easy. We all know this whole room knows that it's not easy to execute. Yeah, exactly. Um, how many idea, like, iterations, like, when did the, like, how did you settle on the pigeon to represent your stamp on New York in this collaboration with Nike? Uh, we were already developing a, a mascot for the brand. You know, so there was already something in the works about for staple, design. For staple the clothing line, yeah. Got it. And so when he said we wanted to make a dunk dedicated to New York City, we actually brainstormed sort of like um, maybe it should be like a ta like a yellow taxi dunk or like a Statue of Liberty dunk or the mm -hmm. Empire State Building dunk or something like that. And yeah. then um, as we were working on this pigeon sort of separately, we were like, well, doesn't a pigeon? perfectly represent New York City, you know, and the argument internally was like, but maybe if you're not from New York City, you don't get that insight, you know, like if you live in Rhode Island your whole life, like you come to New York City for the weekend, you don't necessarily think pigeons in New York City. Pigeons in New York City is only something that if you live and work and breathe in New York, then you get what a pigeon means. And so that was like the backlash on the idea, but then the opposite end was that, no, that's what makes it dope. It's like mm -hmm. secret code for New Yorkers. If you get it, you get it. Exactly. If you get it, you get it. And so, you know, we finally, of course, decided, like, the other thing is, like, the pigeon motif on a shoe just looks fresh, right? Like, other people, when they get to design a, sh a shoe, like, everyone's had this experience when they're on Nike ID, right? Like, you sort of go crazy and you go too much and like your shit looks like the shoe I'm wearing basically like it looks like someone vomited all over your shoe and uh, you, you know you go too crazy and sometimes when you get the opportunity to do a shoe you want to make your mark in the world you want to make it stand out so you make this thing that looks really good 
on Instagram and on a shelf, but maybe doesn't look so good on your feet, you know? But the pigeon actually is a very wearable colorway, right? And um, so we mocked that up, showed it to Nike, and, you know, I, luckily, Nike really trusts our, our relationship and our advice, so I had to sort of pitch him on the idea of what a pigeon meant, because he, he lives in Portland, Oregon. He doesn't know what pigeons mean, you know? Um, but he believed that, like, okay, like, this isn't something that is, like, making fun of our brand, right? Like, we're not... We're not going to get like. Oh, that's interesting. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, cause absolutely. If, yeah, it's like symbols mean different things to different people, and they didn't understand the symbolism of a pigeon, so they fully trusted our interpretation of it. Did they just let it fly, or that you had to do some nice convincing? pun? <laughs> <laughs> Completely unintentional. I am not that witty, but I'll take it. Um, yes, they they let it fly, and uh, he was like, he literally was like, I don't get it, but if you say this is dope, then fine. Shit. And that's what I love about working with with a brand like Nike, because you know, there's there's a lot of people I'm sure here have have had, have had experience working with like clients, and there's all, always this connotation of like the clients like breathing down your neck and saying like, you know, are you sure about that color? Are you sure about that typeface? Like, are, why don't we try a different idea? Like, yo, if you like called me and you asked me to work on something, why are you now questioning my yeah. advice on it? You know, yeah. um, Nike's not like that. I gotta say, once. I think Nike does a lot to vet whether you are a good partner to work with, but once they've said you're the one, they don't then go in and noodle on your shit. They mm -hmm. just like trust whatever it is that you do. This is what year as a refresher? Uh, so the shoe took three years to come out. So it was done in 2002, designed, mm -hmm. and then it came out 2005. So the 2005 moment, now going back to that, yeah. uh, which is the moment of launch, um, 2005 is pre any of this viral social media, mm -hmm. influencer, distributed media platforms that are out here. Yep. Um, the only thing how, that was out was Blogger. Yeah. yeah, Blog, yeah. Blogger. H -E -R, yeah, yeah. yeah, Blogger. Sure. It was like the only form of social media that was out there. How did it get to that point? Because I know there was like... like East Village, there's like Dave's Quality Meats, mm -hmm. and you'd go there for like some exclusive kicks and Nort like, Recon, yeah, A Life, like, yeah. You had, I mean, you had the subculture was popping, right? Mm -hmm. Like it was bubbling. Yeah. But you never had this like, let me sleep on the street and wait for a sneaker yeah. or any product, to and watch. then let me fight you like yeah. to to the death for my place in line. <laughs> yeah, people were getting jumped outside, right? Leave yeah. it anyway. But like, how how did the the word get distributed? How did it get out there? I honestly don't know the answer specifically to that question of how the information was disseminated because this is pre-social media. Yeah. You know, so like, I left the office that night quite late, the day before the launch. Like, I left at like midnight maybe, and there was. What were you doing the night before? Uh. Was it like setup of the store? No. Like just I. That's how late I usually work. Okay. <laughs> Normal no, night. No. Just um, another day. Yeah, and like as you day. mentioned, it was blizzarding. It was like yeah. really bad snowstorm, February twenty-first, two thousand and five. And I went out and I saw like maybe 25 kids sleeping outside. And I remember I went and- Went on your way out. Yeah, and I yeah. went and I bought like pizza for them to cause like they were to yeah. sleep there. And Yo, then, shout out to Scars, Scars is in the building, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, the next morning I came out at like 10 a.m. and there was like hundreds of people there. So overnight, I, while I was sleeping, I don't know exactly what happened, what happened? where like everyone decided to come. Um, but yeah, it was, it was mayhem and, you know, because of lack of experience and organization on my part, sure. because there was no precedence for it, right? Like I had no ticketing system. I had no lottery. I had no raffle. These are all things that you hear no about. No augmented reality. No, I know AR drop and shit. <laughs> no, yeah. Like these are all things you hear about now, but like I was walking in like, wait, what? Like yeah. what's happening? Why are the cops here? Why is... The SWAT, why is there this a SWAT This is my store, truck? guys. Yeah. yeah and the cops are like, the fuck's going on here? And I was like, I, I'm Sell selling a sneaker. A sneaker. Sir, yeah. What's in the sneaker? Drugs? You putting drugs in the shoe boxes? I'm like, no, there's a sneak. Why are all these kids waiting for sneakers? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why they're here. <laughs> He's like, you know, like, he was like, uh, we were trying to disperse the line, and we said, like, we'll arrest you if you don't get off the line. And kids are like, arrest me, but let me buy the shoe first, and then you could arrest me. So the cops are like, I don't understand what you're doing here, but you're not, you can't just be selling sneakers. I was like, that I am is, just selling sneakers. That <laughs> is wild. Let's yeah. give it up for that real quick. <laughs> <laughs> that is, you know, 
this has now transpired from 2005, and, and, and a lot of people look at that as a catalyzing moment of you know brand strategy and limited runs, and you know whether it is happening before that or not, yeah. that is pointed to as a tipping point. Yeah. Um, today we're we're in a sneaker culture is pop culture. Yes. Essentially, it is. It's everywhere. almost worse than pop culture now. It's, it's still <laughs> exclusive, though, which is it, wild. Okay, I guess so. Where it's you, I gotten mean, so big, it's just insane to me. It's very opinionated, which is interesting. Yeah, yeah. Actually, how comfortable are you with uh, talking about what recently happened with Urban Necessities and oh, uh, very American Eagle? Yeah, Okay, yeah. so I'm going to skip a few generations. You've done uh, collaborations, and we don't have to talk through them, but I, you have on your website... I mean, like literally an A through Z index of different <laughs> projects you've worked on yeah. by brand first, like initial. That's I mean, so you have now. It's taken, like a telephone book. It's <laughs> wild, dude. It is unbelievable. But um, uh, it, I'll, the brevity of your work and the way that you've collaborated with so many entities mm -hmm. is tremendous. Recently, um, you know, in, in understanding and following your journey, this has been super organic. Um, you've been uh, a real advocate of community and support a community and congregating people and pushing messages forward for the good mm -hmm. your entire career. Um, you <coughs> sent out, so recently Urban Necessities, which is, I guess, a consignment retailer, a reseller, mm -hmm. essentially, uh, did a collaboration with uh, American Eagle where they now came into their Soho store, which is quite a large flagship store. And because their wares uh, or their partners um, uh, the sneakers that they provide on their platform include a lot of staple designs, as they, yeah. they should, because um, it is still ranked the number one most iconic sneaker collaboration, by the way, the SB Dunk, which you know. Um, you took a picture of it, put it up on Instagram. I was looking through your feed, and it's <coughs> like, you know, 17 comments, 10 comments, 8, 17, 22, 90,000 fucking comments <laughs> on this picture. And I'm looking, I'm like, what happened here, right? And this yeah. is somewhat recent, right? Yeah, like, yeah it was just, last week. Yeah. yeah, and I'm looking at this, I'm like, oh, shit. I went through every fucking comment, dude. Oh, wow. I was up forever just reading this. And I'm fascinating as, you know, like people say <laughs> that, like, if there's no opinion about you, if there's no polarization of what you're doing, you're not doing shit. Right. So you must be doing a lot because like split down the middle, people are furious and yeah. also massive advocates yeah. of, of your perspective. Can you talk through kind of what transpired there and like what's happening right now? Yeah. Um, so I mean, you summarized it really well. I'll tell you from my perspective what it was. You know, like, I just walked by the American Eagle store and... And saw your sneakers. Does there. everyone know what American Eagle is? Yeah. Right. It's like, let's just admit, like, it's not very cool. Right? On the cool yeah. index... Right. It's, right. <laughs> I don't know if anyone works at American Eagle, yeah. but, like, <laughs> it's well below a five on the cool scale, right? Okay, so... And it is what it is. So I walk by... That's and, a failing grade, by the yeah. way. <laughs> on, the cool, on the cool scale. Yeah, I walk by... <laughs> And I see like pigeon logos in the window, and I'm like sort of doing a double take. I'm is like, is that Wait. mine? Yeah. Pigeon I'm like, is, whoa, someone's bootlegging me. No, they're not. That's actually my shit in the American Eagle. And then I'm like, did American Eagle go out of business and now something new is here? Like, I took like a triple take. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I was like, no, they didn't these take are, the signage down no. yet. <laughs> it says American Eagle. These are my shoes, front and center in the window display. And I was like, what the fuck's going on? Walk around the corner, check their big billboards on Houston Street, and then I see Concepts Purple Lobster. I see DJ Khaled's Jordan 3. I see Travis Scott's Jordan, right? And I'm like, with an American Eagle logo on the bottom of it. And I'm like, what the fuck is going on here? Yeah. Yeah. So then I look up what I didn't, I honestly did not know what Urban Necessities was. Yeah. And so I look up what Urban Necessities is, and it's a reseller. And then I find out a, a news article that American Eagle partnered with or invested into this reseller. And so now they, I guess, feel like they have the right to display other people's marks. You know, like mm -hmm. Khaled. Trademarks. Yeah, trade, like Khaled has like We the Best. That's his company. That's his logo. And now there's a We the Best logo with an American Eagle logo. And Brand I, alignment's important. I felt like that was wrong. It mm -hmm. felt wrong to me, right? And um, so I did this post and, you know, maybe. I didn't, it, like, this goes back to my journalism school, right? Like, maybe I didn't word it properly. Maybe my caption was not, uh, like, explicit enough of my views. Or maybe people just don't read completely. They don't. They don't. Yeah, they I think don't. that's what it is. I think they don't read past the first few sentences. 
Um, but a lot of people who were hating on the comment thought that I was anti-reselling, either anti-reselling or B, anti uh, entrepreneurialism in the sense that the urban necessities guys struck a deal with American Eagle and hence like the the notion of a sellout move is something yep. else that I was against I'm totally all for selling out <laughs> there to me in this day and age there is no such thing as selling out you cannot sell out now like literally you cannot sell out yes because making money is cool again yeah and it's just <laughs> like, to me it's, it's like we're we're in the age of robin hood now yeah. like if i do a deal like i want to do a deal with and like lifting. charmin toilet paper yes. let me do a collab with walmart you know what i mean like <laughs> i just want to like i don't care how big it gets you yeah. can't get any you know there's no such thing anymore so like to yeah. me i'm all for selling out i'm all for entrepreneurialism and i'm all for reselling reselling is you know, a lot of people said in the comments, like, the reason why your shoes are so valuable in, like, image is because market. of resale, right? Sure. So I get that. It's American Eagle basically taking other people's intellectual property and IP and putting their logo under it and making the, um, the connotation that we have collaborated. And that shit is really wrong. So what's next, though? Because you have, like, consignments not new. You have luxury consignments like the Real Real. You have Poshmark out there. You mm -hmm. have the... This is something that... This is probably the first flag. Yeah. The first time that this has ever been faced. So, like, now do we move towards a legislative move? Or mm -hmm. how are you going to, like, strategize our band um, together with those other... With the resellers, with other brands, with, you know? Um, so I've talked to my legal counsel about it. And, you know, American Eagle is a $4 billion company. Yeah, and their money. advice was like, this is not a fight that you want to fight. A $4 billion not cool company. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> and uh, so I brought this up to Nike. And luckily I have, like, you know, the phone call, of the, the phone number of the people at Nike. Mm -hmm. And they were like, this is fucking crazy. No. And so they are now gathering their legal troops together to see what can be done. And so now they'll be like, I'm not saying, like, a head-on WrestleMania, but there will be a conversation. There'll be a be conversation. Yes. That's important. Yes. yes, there'll be a conversation. Yeah, <laughs> and that to me, that's Robin Hood, right? Yeah. I'm not gonna bankrupt my ass trying to fight American Eagle. Yeah, I'll let Nike do. It. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, 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 it's the same thing, right? Nike, uh, uh, Nike is in that same Robin Hood mentality and that frame yeah. of mind where they're like, yeah. look, no, we have to stand for our people, right. our collaborators, and like what's going on here, yeah. what actually is right and what's wrong. Yeah. So the other thing that happened out of that is the owner of Urban Necessities, who I also didn't know until this thing happened, because me, many people started tagging the owner saying like yo Jeff's calling you out like, oh, you know like so like, <laughs> like and he on. poor guy he was like yo I would just love your shoe and I wanted to put it <laughs> in the middle of the yeah. window display That's I'm right. really, you know so so actually <laughs> me and him started DMing yeah. and um, actually this Friday two days from now he's gonna be on my podcast oh, on the dope. business of hype so we're gonna we're gonna hash it out for everyone to hear Absolutely. and so that'll be really good and um, I just want kids on both sides of that fence that love it or hate it. I want them to hear it from both perspectives, you know? Um, so yeah, I think it's going to be amazing. I think it's an, it's a really, really important it's uh, movement that's yeah. happening because it hasn't, there hasn't been a precedent like many of other things that you've uh, encountered in your, in your career, but this is really <laughs> pushing forward yeah. now a path, right? So whatever the path, wherever it lands, yeah. it will be a path, right? right. It, hopefully it'll be clear. Yeah. I mean, I'll give you another example. <clears throat> like, do you guys know the, the website goat, like the app? Goat. It's a reselling app. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you know, but Foot Locker just invested a hundred million dollars in the Goat, and mm -hmm. they they own a, a minority stake in yeah. it. So now Foot Locker owns Goat. Same By the way, way, you said a minority stake at a hundred million dollars. I know. Dollars. Like nothing. Like here, yeah. you could have this like p pinky. Goat's a beast. Goat's a beast. Yeah. So it's the same exact deal as American Eagle buying into Urban Necessities, right? And that's why American Eagle feels they have the right to do this. So Foot Locker, you guys know what Foot Locker sells. Right, Jordans, Nikes, that's it. Now, if you go on GOAT, you can buy Versace, Balenciaga, mm -hmm. Gucci shoes, right? So does that mean that Foot Locker can now take Balenciaga shoes and just put them in the window display of Foot Locker? Right, if, mm -hmm. if the American Eagle rule, I don't know yet. Right. That's what we're I about mean, to find out. No, though. obviously, if you're Balenciaga, how is that okay? Like, we control our distribution 
to a T, and now Foot Locker is just allowed to put our shoes in their well, window. And that's the thing here. Like brand alignment is so important, especially yeah. when, particularly when you call luxury. And there is a or exclusivity, or yeah. Ex- whatever, well, yeah. no, there there's a blending of luxury and streetwear. Yeah, it's the same. It's the same thing now. Thing yes, now, right. So yeah. So there is a path that needs to be carved, and this is a really important conversation <laughs> that got catalyzed. It's yeah. wild. I hope. I hope it nets out you right, know, yeah. So I, I'm curious uh, to, to hear your opinion. You know, recently, so I've done a lot of community work, a lot on the grassroots level, and this is a, an example of uh, a new kind of, um, you know, community that I'm looking to nurture and grow and support. And, um, you know, I was recently called an elitist for, for hosting this event that were four <laughs> people that are more... Of, uh, of, I guess, my time and my priorities and, and how I like to spend my free time right. uh, socializing and, and learning and engaging. Yes. You got called so many things as like a sellout. You <laughs> got lucky with the pigeon once and now you got a career off of it. I mean, like nasty shit. Oh, yeah. How do you internalize this stuff? Like, how do you just like? Is this no thing? Like, do you sit at home with Liz and like you're just like, <laughs> yo, are you reading this shit? I like, try. Like, yeah, like, I mean, or, it's crazy. What does it impact? Have you guys seen? Did you know there's a feature on Twitter and Instagram where like, if someone says something really, really bad to you, there's a warning that says you have to hit this button to read this comment because it's so. Lo- like, I see that all day now. Like, click this button to oh. read this extremely. <laughs> offensive comment i'm like okay i'm like it's like a big glow i'm like i kind of want to see it now i hit it it's like you bald-headed chink motherfucking thing. i'm like yeah that was that was a good one that, yeah, was, that good, was good yeah, yeah. I'm, was offended. Good. I'm, I'm offended i'm offended i'm offended slightly offended <laughs> so i'm really impressed with the algorithms of twitter and instagram but no i think i, I think the uh oftentimes like the haters put so much energy and effort into like how they hate that I, f- I wish they just were able to channel that energy into like something positive, you know? Make America great again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's, 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 uh, it's what you said before about like, you know, creating things that like provoke thought and opinion, right? So like, yeah. honestly, those 90,000 comments, 45 of which are haters and 45 are lovers, I'd rather have that than crickets. Because then it's like, whoa, shit, no one cares about anything that I just yeah. put out, you know? So you got to take the love with the hate. It's like they, they kind of come yin and yang, hand in hand together. And you can't, you can't be greedy and be like, yo, why, you know, why am I not only getting all love and adoration? Like, mm-hmm. you can't, that's so greedy to think that way. But I know a lot of, a lot of younger people have trouble with that. Like this, um, this sort of like public display of what it is that you create and then equally public display Mm -hmm. of criticism and hatred because it's different if I see you in this room and I'm like, yo, I'm not feeling those pants that you did. It's just me and you, Mm -hmm. right? Like you walk out of the room and it's done. But for me to write it on your wall or board or comment and have all your friends see it and your family members Mm -hmm. and like you're trying to get work, you're trying to out there hustle, you know, and someone else sees like, Yo, someone said your pants are whack, you know? And it's like, are they whack? Like, some people don't know, right? <laughs> so it's like, I could, I could understand why that really, like, affects you in a, in a really deep way. But it takes very, very thick skin um, or ego <laughs> to, like, just see, rise above that. Was there a conscious decision? Was there ever had to be a conscious decision of, like starting to hide these negative comments? Or no. Just, you were just like, I yo, let it, it rip. Like, yeah, it I love it. I love it. And like, I f- sometimes, <laughs> I, I remember one comment stuck in my head where it's like, one kid said, well, this didn't turn out the way you had hoped for, did it? Like, so, like you know, with all the negativity. Yeah. And I'm like, bro, you know I can just delete these comments. I yeah. could delete your comment and all the hate and just make it look like my whole feed is like glory, glory adoration, right? But I'm not. Like, I'm letting everyone yeah. speak their mind. But, like, I wanted to say that so bad, but I didn't want to give him the shine, too. It's whenever, obvious to people that know. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. And it's just whatever. So like, fuck him. Yeah, <laughs> it's fine. Um, so you, one of the quotes that um, I heard you uh, recite, which I thought was really interesting, is, um, you know, you're, you're transitioning from making the dishes if, you know, in a restaurant to actually seeing how to build the next restaurant. 
and I definitely did not phrase that correctly. So I hope that you end up rephrasing it. But um, I, I'm curious to hear what your next project, what your next restaurant is. Ah. Uh. But first, correct me on that. I don't even know. Because I said it terribly. I don't even know. Uh, it was something to the effect of, like, look, I mean, you probably spit it out on the top of the head. Yeah, but like, I, do. You know, I don't remember that anything. That bald, chinky head of yours. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, like, it was honestly, it was, uh, it was something like, look, you know, uh, somebody in the restaurant, it's like somebody in the restaurant business being like, hey, I went from chef to making dishes to mm-hmm. chef that's planning their next restaurant. That's oh, what it was. okay. Okay. So, what is the next restaurant that you're planning? Uh, I don't know. I mean, as you can as you can tell throughout the different chapters and careers of like that my life has had, nothing was really pre-planned. Planned. Yeah, I think that's really the key is like just going with the flow. What has your experience been with Business of Hype? It is a tremendous podcast. I urge everybody in their room, in this room if you are not already listening to it uh, to definitely tune in, subscribe. I subscribe, I listen regularly. Um, it's fantastic. Thanks. But wh- what has your experience and your journey been with the podcast? Is there any in- was there any guided intent before that or no? Um, How did that start? <clears throat> uh, let's see. I, l- I like podcasts a lot. Mm-hmm. And I thought that with the conversations that I often have with people, kind of like you and me sitting here or like if we're at a bar or a cafe and like, you know, we just sort of shoot the shit and talk about real problems. I felt like a lot of people could benefit from hearing those stories as if they were like a fly on the wall, right? Mm -hmm. And I think I'm in a unique position where I can sit down with like a John Wexler or Jerry Lorenzo, Jerry Lorenzo or a Sean Witherspoon and not be like a journalist and being like, so, you know, like what was your inspiration behind this design? But like talk real to real and just be like, what are the trials and tribulations that you're going through in a business? Mm -hmm. I can share little anecdotes of what I'm going through too and just have a convo, you know? And let's record that and put it out as a podcast. And so that was really the impetus behind doing that. And if you've followed the stuff that I've been doing before, like with, I used to have a video series called the one-to-one series. Mm -hmm. It was on video. I've done live ones. You've been a big content person. (laughs) I guess. I hate that word. Content. But whatever. Yeah. I mean, it's just... It's creator, just, creator, pe- creator. It's just Let's putting it out there, you know? Yeah. And I, I yeah. probably often do it, like, in the wrong way. Like, with the one-to-one videos, I put them out on Vimeo. I probably should have put them out on YouTube, mm. you know? Search engine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, like, the podcast, you know, I have it on Hypebeast, which is very cool, but, like, you know, maybe it should be on CNN. I don't know, you know what I mean? But, like, yeah. I just like to work with people that I like and people I'm friends with, and I happen to be good friends with the founder of Hypebeast, and we were having an organic dinner... You know, not organic food. It was like fried chicken, but it was like it was just like, <laughs> like an organic. Or, yeah, it was an, an organic, organic natural dinner. Yeah. And I was like, "Yo, I want to do a, a podcast." And he's like, "We'll host it," you know. And I was like, "Well, that'll be better than if I host it myself, yeah, right?" Absolutely. So you know, it just happened that way, and it, it just um, it's the traction of it has been amazing. Um, and I'm, you know, you talked about the going with my first episode, going back to Hiroshi Fujiwara. So yeah. I felt with everything that had gone on with Fragment and like what he was doing and my relationship with him going back 20 years, as I embarked on this new platform, it would be fitting to like go back to him to do the first story. And the conversation that we had, I don't know if anyone has heard this episode, but I highly encourage you to listen to it. But he talks about stuff in this episode that like he's never said in, you know, he talks about like, his taxes that he pays, properties that he owns, how many employees he has, and how he's trying to like downscale his business and shit like that. You know, it's real insight. Yeah, he talks about Virgil. You know, he talks about like how the ten from Virgil affected him and his collaborations. Like really deep shit mm. that I think a lot of other stories, you know, storytellers wouldn't be able to get that angle out of him. When I'm at festivals like Art Basel, I remember like I think Virgil might have like doppelgangers around because he was everywhere, whether he was DJing or speaking and things like that. <laughs> Are you still like inclined to go back to like DJing a party every now and then or like every now and then? Yeah, I mean, I still I've come out of retirement. You know, I'll do like a gig on like um, like Shade Forty Five asked me to come and do a gig every once in a while, but I suck now. Like <laughs> DJing is like DJing is not like riding a bike. DJing is yeah. like skateboarding. Like 100%. if you take yeah. off for a while, you are rusty as If you can't hell. feel the tremors, you're fucked. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's bad. So 100%. I try so to... So who are you looking to connect with these days? Uh, we're, of course, sitting here in front of uh, a ton of creators and yeah. artists and, and, and culture <coughs> pushers and, and whoever might be listening also. Uh, who are you looking to connect with? Individual people? What types of folks? Um, I'm really into people who are, like, focused to their craft um, beyond reason. 
you know, like, I think a lot of people in, in this day and age are like, they are trying to find a passion, but then they're very quickly trying to figure out how to monetize their passion, right? Or like, you look at it, like, whether it's actual financial monetization or like, you know, if you, put it this way, if you're like a singer and you have a YouTube channel, you're trying to get views, right? If you're an Instagram blogger, you're trying to get likes and comments, you're trying to get engagement. And there's a very small number of people who are doing what they love to do and don't care about that shit. Like, you know, like, when you're in a room right now and you're networking with people and you see some very creative person and you're like, yo, let me, what's your IG? Let me follow you. I don't have IG. Mm -hmm. Isn't that the person that you're like, what? what? What planet are you from? You don't have IG, but like, those are the people that I'm really, really interested in because they're doing it for another reason that I, as a big sellout, <laughs> you know, like, I want to tap into that energy that that person has of like, why are you like, getting up at 4 a.m. every day doing this thing for like no money, no love, no adoration. Like mm -hmm. I want to try to remember that reason of like why I started. And so I'm always gravitating the, like towards those type of people. What is the best way to connect with you and follow your journey? Uh, whether it be social, whether it be LinkedIn, like any anything. What's the best way to, to you should, follow uh, your journey and connect? You should write me a handwritten postcard and mail it with the U.S. Postal Service. <laughs> to uh, our address. That's how I'll really notice it. No, no shit. I mean, that's yeah. When true, I open right? that is letters, true. Yes, yeah, yeah. that is Find true. out where you're at. Yeah. Send you a note. But if you're like a normal person, I'm at Jeff Staple on Instagram and Twitter. Jeff, it has been an absolute pleasure to have you over here. Uh, thank you so much for being part of this and being thank part you, of man. the inaugural season of uh, of Bellwether Culture Podcast. Thanks. And uh, for everybody over here, um, thanks for coming out. Yeah, yeah, thanks for coming out. So that's it. Here it is. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeff Staple of Staple Design. Thank you.